All right, so today we're I'm going to talk about chapter 25, the last chapter, yay. <laughs> and so this is about uh, rewriting our code in C++. So just before I go into the chapter, I'm not an expert, I've done some C++, so that helps for my expert. Um, so the introduction is, uh, well, what's RCPP, which is R C++, that's what it stands for. Uh, and it's just an, a an approachable API that lets you write high performance uh, code um, using C++. And then that's uh, under the hood, uh, it's interpreted uh, so R can use it. And that's what it's cool to me because then uh, we will see that it's not, I mean, at least to me, it's not that different because uh, then you can uh, pass functions to the C++ code. You can uh, run R code in the same file that you have the C++ code. And there are things that to me makes it friendlier because it's not like two completely different things that believe in different worlds, like they kind of mix. So I like that. Uh, and well, that's thanks to people working on this package because I imagine it's a lot of work and I read that it's been a long time that they've been working on this idea of using C++ um, with R. Uh, so some typical bottlenecks that C++ can address. Uh, so it's loops uh, that can not be easily vectorized. And so the justification for this and uh, the book is that uh, loops overall are cheaper to run uh, computationally speaking. So you need uh, less resources to run loops. So something that in R you will say, oh no, I don't want to use a loop for that. Uh, then in C++ it might be fine because just um, how little computational power it needs in comparison to running that same book in R. Uh, then recursive functions. And I think there's an example of recursive functions uh, in one of the sections. So let's talk more about that. And then uh, this one that it's interesting to me, problems that require uh, advanced um, data structures. And so sometimes you might find yourself but I guess this is very particular to what you're trying to solve with R. That may be a data frame. It's not the kind of a structure that you're interested in or to solve a particular problem. So you need other uh, structures. And then we're gonna talk in one of the sections, what structures are those and how we use them. Uh, you need to do the stuff in this section, uh, this package, RCVP, and a working C++ compiler. Then uh, there's see many instructions in the book. So on that other link I sent last week, there are some, some instructions how you do that on different OS, because uh, then it's different. If you are on Mac, you have to do Xcode, um, Windows, you do our tools, and I think Linux is much easier because you have to like uh, jump install or well, any of those depending on which distribution of Linux you're using. Good, all right. So, section two jumps immediately into creating a function, and I'm assuming none of you has any experience in C++. So maybe I'll just going to explain uh, a little bit of the notation. Because then uh, when we try to jump to a different language, we just want to say, okay, this I did in R and this is the equivalent. And uh, what are the things that I need? So there are a few things. Uh, in R, you should start with the name of the function or the object you want to assign the function. In C++, you start with the return type. So in C++, the function 
well, you can have functions that don't return anything. So you just put void, but then you have to explicitly say, what's the return of that function? If you're expecting something, then it's an integer. Um, it can be a vector. It can be void. So you say it doesn't return anything, but then you need that as the first thing. Then of course it comes the name of the function. And then as usual, the parameters, the arguments to that function. And then again, in C++, you have to tell uh, which are the types, the data types. So I guess that that's one of the cool things when you're using like R and Python, you don't really care much, at least when you start about the types. And in Python, I think there's a way you define them, but I'm not sure in R. For you just do X, Y, Z, you don't say this is an integer, this is a double, or this is a boolean, or this is a character. But in C++, you have, you have to specify that. So this function will work with a, a string, for example, because then you'll say, well, I'm expecting X to be of an integer. And if you pass something else, you uh, throw a, an error. And then, uh, well, this one is just a addition. So you add X, Y, and Z. And so when you define variables, then again, you have to specify the type of the variable. So if we were doing this in R, you just say sum and then assign X plus Z plus plus y plus z. And, but then in C++ you have to say, what's the type of that? So integer sum and something that uh, I remember when I started in C++, I always forget this day, semicolon. So every statement needs that semicolon. And then uh, it's horrible when you have like a very long code, like a long function and somewhere you forgot the semicolon, but then, uh, some debuggers won't tell you exactly in which line that's happening. So they will say, well, you're missing something, but well, where is that? So then you have to go through your code and make sure there's a semicolon at the end. So that's one of the things. And so this function is still simple, <laughs> I think. So it's what I'm expecting to be returned, the name, what I am passing to the function. So X, Y, Z and then the return, which you have to explicitly say, return this. In R, you can say just sum, and then you will know that that's where it's returning. And then the way you call that function is, well, you just call it as usual in R. So add, and then the three values, one, two, and three, then that gives you the result. Now in the book say uh, that there are, at least four types of functions. So no inputs, and what we're gonna cover those four types. So the first one is a function without input, and uh, it will return a scalar. So no vector, just a single number, a single string, one thing. And so the way that looks is, this is the way it looks in R. So you say function, and return a number one. And then in C++, used to return type, integer, name, parentheses, and then empty parentheses, saying that there's no inputs, and then return the actual thing. Uh, to, to, to some key points, well, I already mentioned this, that sometimes you have a function that you call for the side effect. Maybe you want to print something on the screen, uh, or you want to check, um, a me print a message based on uh, if an object inherits, for example, a certain class. And in one of the examples, we're gonna see how to do that. How can you check the inher if it inherits a class? And in those cases that you're not returning anything, you can use void as a type. So instead of integer, you can say void and then print something here. Uh, well, the return type has to, be, has to be explicitly declared and then the statement is ending with semicolon. And do let me know if you have any questions.
um, at any time. Then the next type of function is uh, you have a scalar input, a scalar output. So the single value is input and then the single value comes out. And this function is just to find the sign of a, a, an input, an integer. So you have x and then you say, another cool thing is the if else statements are exactly the same, but they look exactly the same as in uh, R. So this is the R version of the function. You have if something exactly the same notation in um, C++. So I guess that's a, a plus, a win. Uh, the notation is similar. Uh, but then again, you have to explicitly say, I want to return one, I want to return zero, I want to return minus one. Uh, in R, you have to do that. And the comparison, it's the same, two equals uh, signs. Uh, let's see, tick, tick, tick. I think I already talked about distance, and then the if sentence is identical. Then the next one is you have a vector input and then you have a scalar uh, output. So you have a vector and then just a single number, for example. And so this is um, for sum. So if you were to implement this in R to sum, like using a loop, which you really need to because there's a function, but then you'll do it this way. So you have the total, you have a vector of numbers, and then you will look through them and then just add to total each of the elements. Um, one thing here that you want to be careful, I think it's the key points, uh, it's that in R, your indices uh, for vectors, it starts from one through N, so one to three and to all the way to N. Oh, in C++, you have to start with an index of zero. So that's one common uh, like gotcha. Like if you're trying to move between languages, it's like, well, why I'm not, I have to 10 elements, or I'm getting only the, uh, the sum of nine of the elements. And so you have to be careful. Or sometimes you will, might try to access the element in the 10th position with index 10. And then C++ will say, well, that's, out of bounds, so I don't have a element in the position with index 10, it should be nine. Um, and here there's one big difference. So in the four um, loops, in C++ you have three, you can see as it three sections. So you have uh, where you initialize your control variable, which, here we define as i, and so here I'll say integer i, and then initialize that as zero. So that's the init section. Then you have a control section, which is keep looping until this is not true. So while, whilst this is true, whatever is here, then keep looping. And then you have a update uh, the control variable. So your control variable is i, so you are saying add uh, one, increase the value of i in one, which is this plus plus, uh, which you can also do the other way around. So i plus plus. And in the context of this for loop, there's no difference. Or uh, sometimes the difference between having plus plus i or i plus plus is that plus plus i will do the increment the value first. So increase the value of i in by one unit and then do something else. So if you have plus plus i plus something, plus one, uh, I will put it in the chat. Uh, so plus plus i plus one, oh, sorry. What was that? Upper case. Okay. One second. Sorry. That, I believe it will be different than that. 
this. So the order in which you have the plus plus, because the first one where you have plus plus i plus one, then you do increment i first divided by. So if i was zero, then you, when you do plus plus i is one, plus one, that's two. And then I think the other one, i plus 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 one, it does the i plus one first and then increases the value of i. Maybe we're just gonna ignore that for the time being. Does that make sense? A question. Yeah. So when do you decide to use C plus as opposed to using R? Um so for example, here uh you see this point that the cost right. of the loops it's much lower in C. So imagine you have something, uh, some computation, and maybe not even a mapping, like you super will you will you will work because you say, oh, this is taking way too long, or moving that to a mapping function for some reason it will be too complex. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, that's not the case because well, I mean, more I mean, Sorry. That's that's all right. <laughs> Well, um, at what point right. do you decide to totally switch over to be like R is not doing it for me? I gotta fully convert over to C plus plus, or have have you not encountered that at all? I have not, because <laughs> up to like reading this chapter, I have not used uh, RCPP. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it will be in which I don't know. I can't think of a case now, but it will be that in which I say, oh doing this in a mapping function will be too complex, will be too messy, for example. Mm -hmm. I can see it more clearly in a zip, in a in a for loop. Because then a for loop you just have a sequence of steps. And so it might be easier to, to see like to understand what it's doing the code. And then uh, in in R, in base R you might say, well, this loop that I runs for one million iterations, it may be like uh, not a good idea in R. But then the way they say is that if you do that exact same uh, loop in C++, then ideally you get the benefits of having code being easy to read, but then you don't have the overhead that the uh, loop in R has. So basically is you really, really want to use a for loop for you in you know that using R will be uh, will take ages to run, it. and so in that case, you, I will say try to do that in C plus plus. But then the thing is, well, maybe you're not completely familiar with C plus plus, and then in R uh, you can just call another package. So that might be a reason for you to say, oh, I don't want to move to C plus plus. Because then for an R, I can easily call uh, functions from the package. But that might not be a good excuse because my, uh, in one of the slides and all the sections I had, you can pass a function as an argument to a C function. <laughs> so imagine you can call the function you will call in R within the C code. So Mm, I can't think of a a reason for not to. <laughs> Other than you, you also want to mess up with C and okay. just want to stay safe with R. <laughs> this helps me think about it more. Thank you. Mm, yeah, I have a situation uh, where I would like to switch to C plus plus. I think it's a use case that ideally I would be able to, but after reading this chapter, I don't feel confident in doing so just because it's so different and mm. I've already just been encountering a lot of issues trying to do it. Um, mm. But it's like a situation where you have to look at every single value in a data set and you have to see if that value reaches a threshold point and it may or may not. So every single value in the data set has to loop over the whole data set in a while loop and see if a condition breaks uh, and do a calculation if the condition breaks. And if it does not break, then it just is in a 
And so if you're doing, I'm doing like, 25 different thousand data, 25 different data sets with about a thousand observations in each. So like that is all coded in R and it takes like three days to run all of them. Uh, and so I would really like to like make that function that does that looping, looking at for the threshold in C++ because I feel like that's probably gonna be exponentially faster. So yeah. that, that would be a use case. Yeah, the only thing is uh, if you are calling some function in in that loop, some function from a NOR package, and uh, maybe the function itself is very slow. So then you have to go a step beyond and say, well, maybe I'll have to implement that other function from this package in C++ so I actually get the real benefits of using C++. Yeah, that's the intimidating part about it, is it yeah. uses functions that are built in R that I would then have to create in C++ as well, like, because you just kind of have to go down the whole stack. Um, yeah. I guess unless you pass the function from R to be called in the C function, but yeah. I guess if it's got a lot of overhead, then you're kind of defeating the purpose of switching to C++ for the other stuff. Yeah. I mean, another thing is that if you're doing some of this for work, uh, maybe it will take you some time. Like you might might get it done, but it will take you some time because you have to explore and try different things. And then we will be, well, we need this for next week. So we can't really afford having you testing all of this. And so that's why I really haven't done it like for work. Because then it's like, well, we have this deadline. So we, we want results now. Like you can't really afford having you testing this for like a month and trying different things. Just to realize that after that month of work, you save one hour of computational time. So, but then uh, it's something that I would like to keep doing and I will try to keep doing because then I know at some point it will pay off, like learning little bits here and there. And so it will pay off at some point. So I encourage you to do the same. Even if it's just like a very small for loop thing, but then you just have like the notion of how this works and that that's available to you. And in section five, I think it's where we discuss the standard uh, library, which is like highly optimized and highly tested functions that are there for you to use. And so think of them as uh, Legos. So you just bring all these pieces together and can put something very cool without a lot of work because someone else already did it for you. So I guess that's good. All right. Sorry, I think I'm moving to somewhere else. Uh, so uh, as I was saying, the notation of the for loop is you have three sections uh, the initialize section, then you have the check and an increment section. Uh, and then this was like all uppercase, remember indices start with zero, no one in C++. And one other thing is my have noticed this notation plus equal uh, that I really wish we had something like that in R like natively. Cause I mean, you could just do like an uh, override your operator to do that. But then what this does is it takes the current value total and then adds that to this and to the right. So it takes the type in some okay. And then you can do the same thing with uh, minus equal, times equal, and for division. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All right. Um, and then the last uh, kind of functions is you have a vector input and then a vector output. So I guess here's where you see where people say, oh, I will write a stick with R. Because I mean, this function, this how it looks in R, you have X and Y, S, and then this how that same function will look on C++. The only thing is, uh, let's see, I think I'm having my key points. 
Well, no, it's not. Uh, what they say on the book is that, well, on R, in R, if you don't have documentation for this function, you don't know like if X is a vector, a single value, or a matrix. What's 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 going on with X? And same with Y, S. On the other hand, if you see your C++ code, by looking at the function definition, you know that X is a double and just a single number and a scalar, and then Y, S is a numeric vector. So beforehand, before running anything, you know um, what kind of data is this function expecting from you. Um, another thing that it's new is to find the size of a vector. Um, in R, we'll do length. And in C++, you usually uh, use the dot. So uh, this might be, if someone is familiar with Python, I think this is the case in Python as well, that you have your object or your variable, and then you do that something, and then different options will come up based on the type or class of that object. So for numeric vectors, they have a, you can think of an attribute, so you access the attribute size with this, but then you access it as if it was a function. So give me the size of ys, and then we save that into n, then I think uh, June said on the chat that this was a funny notation because it looks like you're calling a function. You're saying out and then uh, round parentheses n. But then it's like, hmm, when did I define that out function? But that, what that's doing is this is a class. So it's defining an object of class numeric vectors called out, but it has uh, this number of elements. So I think uh, you said this, but I think that's equivalent to say numeric uh, vector, I'm sending the chat. Uh, out. And then I think you have to do new uh, numeric vector uh, n. I'm not very sure of the notation, but it's something like that. So you, that's like a shortcut or shorthand to say uh, this object out is equal to a new object of this class with this size, size n. So that's how you have to define a, a vector. And then uh, the notation here is the same, initialize, control, and then uh, in increment. And then uh, square root and for powers, you have to use P O W instead of uh, the hat that we use in R. Go other than that, I think it's very similar to what we did. Oh, sorry. Uh, All right. Are there any questions here? All good. So what this does is it takes uh, every element of Y S, and then it subtracts. X to that. Yeah, I have a question mm -hmm. about the 2.0. Do you need the explicit decimal to say that we're dealing with a double, not an integer? Like, does it break yeah. if we just put two? Uh, you know, mm, I don't know if it breaks, but I think it actually wants you to specify, like, uh, if you say two, you will take it as an integer. And I will think that, for example, if ys, you have like 2.5. And then it will it will return, it will say, oh, 2.5 minus an integer. Uh, wait. Hmm. I'm actually not sure here <laughs> because this is doing a power. Hmm. I'm not sure. Because yeah, I will say if you, if you were like subtracting it here, maybe. Because then if you have like 2.5 minus 2, then I think it coerces both of them to the same type, which will be to integer. And so 2.5 will be 2 or 3. I'm not sure. But it will be an integer. And so the result will be different. But I'm not sure uh, why you need um, this two here to be a, a double. 
maybe that's in the definition of the power function. Uh, second, I'm just looking the definition of that function. So in it, the exponent has to be a double. So I'll put the reference here. Uh, oh. So they are running for, I will say it might give you at least a warning, if not an error, because then uh, this function is defined with these two numbers being double, of double type. So if you pass an integer here, then the function, it might try to coerce that into a double, or oh, I'm not sure right now if, um, if we will coerce it automatically or if we will have to specify, I want to coerce this value into double if it's not a double. So not sure, sorry. Um, do, 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 do. The, uh, another key point here is that if you have to clone a vector, there's this function clone. So you can make a copy of the existing uh, vector. And I think that's it in that section. And so up to this point, we have been using this CPP function to run uh, C++ code in inline, so in, in quotation marks. Uh, you can, and ideally you should have the code in a separate file. And let me try to share my art studio for a second. Okay. So I'll have to make it bigger. Uh, like that. So in our in our studio, you have the option to create a C file. If you go here to the new file. And then it by default, it puts that uh, header that you need and it even gives you an example. So if you are uh, working on your own um, C++ code, then I would recommend doing that. And so you start with this template. And so you never forget to add those two lines to the header because then otherwise um, our CPP won't recognize them. All right, let me go back to this presentation. Uh, then the file should have an extension that CPP, and we'll need to start with this. Uh, then each function to make available to R, you have to add this uh, line. Otherwise, R won't see. I mean, the function will be defined, but then I won't recognize it. So um, I think I don't have examples in the next section. Uh, and then uh, you can add R code in that C++ file using this uh, slash triple uh, asterisk and then space R. And then you, here you can add R code and I think I might have an example here. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Right. And the last thing is to compile the C++ code, then you have to do source, PPP, and then the path to the file that you created. Uh, using the code, I think I'm going too slow, sorry. Maybe I'm going too fast. Uh, so this is an example of a meme using C, so, and this is in a separate cpp.cpp file. So you have these two lines that you need. Uh, and then you have the line to export the function to R. And then uh, you define the function, return the name, the input, and then you do your actual computation, which is just a for a loop. So it just adds everything and then divides by the size, 15 dB. Uh, this function doesn't account for missing values. 
that was one of the exercises which I didn't do. Well. Um, and then in that same file, you can call the R code. So you see here, we define a variable X uh, with the random unit distribution. Uh, and then you see branch uh, package to compare the results of those two. Uh, there are other, other classes, uh, like other types of inputs, basically. So, for example, we have seen vectors, scalars so far, but then what if you want to pass a list? Well, you can. So, there's a list of class that you can define. So, it's a list and then a name. And then before, I was telling you that you could check uh, for the if an object has a particular class. So this one is meant to, it, this mod needs to be uh, a LM object. So if you do mod that inherits and then what's the class we want to check for, then it will check for that. And then if, it's, if, it, if it doesn't inherit that, then it stop and then just bring that message. Another thing uh, is this, uh, which I keep saying coercion, and I don't know if you're familiar with what coercion is, which is just for the types. So I have a double, but I want it to be an integer so I can coerce that into an integer. Here, what I'm doing is as, uh, and then the class. So this uh, ankle brackets, I think they're called, I just say less than and greater than uh, symbols. Here, you, this notation is because this is a class. So you're saying as a this class, and then what? What do you want to be of that class? Well, you want to be the element in the that it's called residuals in that list. Another thing that they didn't show here is that you can also access elements by index. So if you have a list and you know the index of a particular element, then you can put here uh, the, the index number. And then the index is again from zero to n minus one, the size of your list. Uh, let's see if there's anything new or, I think that's the, those are the only things new, because then we have seen this, how you get the size, so how you convert an object into a particular class. So we, are want, we want this to be a numeric vector. So we do the conversion. And the way we call this function is we run a LM, a linear model, and then pass the app with that model to MPE. And then we do what we want to run here. And let's see. Uh, but then for data frames, I think it might be in the book. You don't have to have a look. Um, another thing is that you can pass functions. So you can pass a function as a input to a C++ function. And then you can return an R object. So the way I see it, this might be very handy if, for example, you have this uh, R package that you want to call in your for loop, for example. And so, but you don't want to implement all of that from scratch in C++. So you just have your for loop and then pass that function as, a, as an input and then call it inside the C++ code. So I think this is cool. Because uh, then you can use external functions for in our packages and not uh, having to convert all the code into C++. The only thing is, as we were saying before, uh, well, that function might not be well optimized for C, like, uh, like might not be optimized at all. So having this function inside a for loop not necessarily will make uh, your entire workflow run faster because then that particular function is very slow. So even though running for loops inside C++ is cheaper than R, 
you probably gain like two nanoseconds every iteration, which is something. Imagine that you have like tens, like 10 million iterations like, to run. So, I mean, that becomes something. For the overall, uh, you don't get much at that point. So then that's something to keep in mind. Now, because I can call the function, the R function inside C++, that'll make it much faster. So just one thing to keep in mind. Oh, it's something very cool that you can uh, return in our object, which you can be anything. And I did a small uh, example, uh, which I don't have. <laughs> just give me a second. Uh, yeah. About this. So in just like, I guess, base C++, do you not have a way of specifying the output as like it can be like either int or double, like you can only pick one type and it just returns stuff yes. with that one type. Okay. Yes. So um, if I have to return like multiple things, I would just create like my own probably a list and just give it a name of the class, which that's what I was gonna show. Uh, I think I have an example because then in the list you can wrap anything you want. Uh, Let's see. Uh, yeah, let me just save it. Uh, okay. So I just have a small example. Yes. So you just call it here. Oh, no. Well, this is what I was telling you before that you can access elements in the list with the index. I hope I hope you can see that. I don't know if it's too tiny the font. Um, or by the name. So both of these will give you the same. But what I want to show is so I have this function. So our object and then receive this, receives a function. So nothing special. But then uh, when I call that function, so I say test function. And so I'm defining my function here. So I just making a table and then just giving it a class which I'm saying oh, I want to append the class rat to that object. And then if I search that, let's see. Hopefully this give me an error. So if I go to my console, I will see here the output. So I call the function and then I have my object here out, which is just a table. But then I gave it a name like here in my function, I give it a, another class, which to me is I want to make that object different. And then I want to handle it in a different way. Because then now imagine if you do that, you could have a S3 generic to do certain behavior to post process that object after you did the computation in C++. So you do the computation in C++, create some uh, new class of object so you know what it is. And then inside R, you can do some post processing or show the results in a different way. So that's one of the uses I thought of. Um, What's the definition of test function again? The uh, C function. One second. So this one, this function is just a simple call, saying call F here. And then just pass a one as the input. So it's just it's just a simple function call basically. Then what I do with it is just a different thing. Uh, mm, wait a second. Mm. Actually, I'm doing this wrong. I should have, for example, here for this to work, it should be x equal x, no equals one. Yeah, my bad. But I mean the output will be should be the same, see? Uh, yeah, so, so sorry about that. Instead of having a one here, it will be the argument, like the part, the input I'm passing here. Because then, I mean, otherwise it will be useless. Because then, for example, I could define a function with x, y. And so I want to say y is a 21. And I want to do something with y. So y will be 
file. I use that for the just proof of concept. And it's to be running very slow. That's my computer. And so here is so you have a table with X and Y, which where the inputs for this function are defined here, but that, that was called cool here. Um right. Let's move on. Is it almost 10? Well, 10 for me. Uh, right. One thing that I actually couldn't make work was this. I don't know if anyone tried this. But it says, like, with position arguments, I mean, of course, you just put in the whatever order you want. But then, if you want to name the arguments, you have to use this syntax. Which is very weird. Uh, it's underscore, and then you have square brackets, the name of the argument, and then the value you are passing to the argument. So I try it, it gave me an error. So let's see if I can show you that. And so maybe I'm just doing something wrong. Okay. Um, let me show you the screen. Yeah. So what I did for that one was I just same like test function and then a function with two arguments. So just my name. And then I use this notation, uh their score and then the names of the arguments. And then uh here in the arc code where, where I call that function, I just say uh well, function that receives name and last name, and then it just creates a table. So when I try to run that, I have to save it. Sorry. It gives me a, let's see. It says something about, it gives me an error that I'm not sure what it is, to be honest. <laughs> It says like uh, operate to see invalid for atomic vectors. So I'm not sure what's happening. So maybe we just move on. Yeah, I, I was trying to use this notation and I failed. Miss uh, Okay. Wait, go yes. back to that. Uh, yeah, that's okay. There. The test function three. Mm -hmm. Where are the variables called last name and name? Like, oh, where are those so, defined as that? So, what I understood is that these names are the are the names of the arguments of this function f. So, if I go to my function oh, definition, okay. see. Function name last name. Uh, okay. I thought that's how it worked. Yeah. So maybe it's not the case, or maybe I'm doing something yeah. something else wrong. Because I think not even this one without the name worked. Maybe let me. Uh, I know what I'm gonna try. So instead of using string, let's use numbers. One, two, two. Okay. In fact, that might be something with the string. No, it's not. There's something. Yeah. Fishy. Which I have to figure out. Okay. Right. Uh, then we have attributes. So um, there's this. Um, I think this is just an A. Yeah, so we're defining a, a function at address of the returns in numeric vector. And so here there's something new. So we are using this create, uh, which is a function from this class numeric vector is how you call. This might look familiar with R actually. So then you can think of this class as the package name and then the function. Well, this is a package. This is just a class. 
And so you're saying create a numeric vector with one, two, and three. So this will be, all of this will be equivalent to use a C or concatenate in inside base R. Um, and then here it just gives uh, the names to that, uh, to that object. So you have a numeric vector, but then you want to give a names, which I will say there are uh, the names linked to each of the values in the vector. Then we're doing R with names. And then you can use this dot ATTR to say attribute. So this is very similar to what we do in R, but then in R we will say names and then the object inside, or we say attributes, then the object, and then what the attribute is. We just see you know, the, the notation here. This kind of reminds me of the R6 notation, but instead of having the dollar sign, you have a dot. Because then you have the object, and that object inherits from its class functions. And, and so you call them a, the dot notation here. Uh, just find that. Then uh, this missing section, uh, I just put a couple of notes here. Oh, I felt like it was like too much just to read it through. Uh, and I was like, ah, oh, this section. I would, I would just be careful when I use uh, missing values. Because then what they're saying is that um, the problem happens uh when for example you use different types of inputs how the NAs are handled so if you have a scalar then missing values are stored as the smallest integer in in c plus plus so if you have something missing and then you are passing that from r but then for some reason you say that missing value minus one or something then that will give you like insanely big and negative number, which in base height, when you say something missing, minus, plus, or whatever operation to missing, then you're expecting the missing to be, to propagate. So missing times something missing, missing plus something, it's missing. But the whole thing here in this section is that you have to be careful based on the type of data you're using because then missions will be handled different. And for example, with doubles, uh, it says that any logical expression that involves NA or not a number or missing, it, it will evaluate false. But that, that's only true if you're doing logical comparisons. So you're saying this missing value is smaller than something, or this, reverse, this missing value is greater than something else. Well, if you do, so in that case, that missing will be by default taken as a false in C++, which might not be the behavior you want. So be careful. And that's the only things I'm gonna cover with missing because I thought it was like, there, there was like too much explanation and it wasn't very clear. So I guess you just come back to this when you're dealing with missing data. So just be careful, it's very messy. Um, and this is one of the final sections, so we're almost over, almost done, uh, which is the standard template library. We think of it as a repository of highly optimized functions. So there's this, uh, this library full of uh, uh, different functions and classes that people have been working for years. Like they have tested this a lot and what what's what's in there you can be certain that it's optimized like probably unless you're like a code of c plus plus you probably won't be able you won't be implementing something more efficient maybe that's an exaggeration but let's say that that's true because these people have been working on this for a long time so that gives you that gives them extra powers uh working uh, for a long time and so one of them, one of those things inside this library, among all the ones there are, are the iterators. So you might be 
familiar with this in some way in R. That, for example, in R, if you have a for loop, you can say x in and then a vector. So that's a form of an iterator because they're saying, I want this x to take one element of my vector one at a time and then loop through those. So that's that's the whole idea of the iterator. So you are taking half a list of an a vector of elements and then you take one at a time and then it loop through them. So the notation it's similar to if the, the common for loop, they're just a couple of things. So you define an iterator this way. So it's from the numeric vector class, then uh, double colon colon iterator, and then you define an object of that class. And then you tell uh, in the initialize, what's your input? So my numeric vector X is my input. And then you tell it begin or initialize that iterator. And then the control will be that iterator, it's not equal to the end of this. So what is this saying is assign to this iterator the first element of the beginning of the of this numeric vector. And then whilst this iterator, it's not equal to the last element or to the end of that numeric vector, then keep doing things. But then you can increment an iterator by one. So that might be something that might look weird because it's like, well, an iterator is not a simple integer, but you can actually increment, increment it by one position, which I imagine what this internal is saying is, okay, just move to the next position instead of just incrementing by one is move to the next reference in memory to the next element. And another new thing here is this asterisk, which they call the D reference uh, operator, which that saying is take the actual value at the position uh, which iterator it's pointing to. So you can think of an iterator as something that points to the location in memory of uh, an entry in the numeric vector. So you have the numeric entry of a vector in memory, and then iterator will point to a to one of the positions, one of the elements in that vector. Hopefully. So to that. use it like as an index, do you do like it dot distance, right? It's like a Just, property. Which I have here. Yeah, it minus. Oh, you subtract X it from the again. Okay. Yeah. So this is if you want to use it as an index. Okay. Which I personally prefer that notation, but I imagine since this is part of the SDL, it's probably like two nanoseconds or like something ridiculous small faster than using the normal notation by index. So that, that's where the perks come. When you use these highly optimized functions, you get those nanoseconds more. <laughs> Save those. Um, another implementation of this same sum is uh, from using these plugins. So there's these uh, plugins that will come from C++11, which this is a, I mean, if you see this code, you're like, Wow, we went from having three sections to just have this constant, which does some automatic thing. And now this ampersand thing, symbol here, X, and then colon, so it, it becomes a little cryptic. Well, what, what this is doing is it does few things. So this comes uh, auto ampersand. First, it finds the type the right type for X. So you see, we're not defining X anywhere. So we're defining X here. But then what's the type of X? Well, the type is defined based on XS. So if I want to iterate over a numeric vector, then X must be a numeric. So it does that. It says, okay, X will be a numeric. And then 
it does the same thing. It iterates over it like, with the iterating. So finds the type of x based on the input of this vector, and then it does the iteration thing. But then here it looks much simpler because then you don't have to dereference. And so just some some stuff to watch out for. If you're using iterator, you have to dereference. If you're using this notation, you don't. So, and it's less code. So once you feel comfortable using this notation, you'll be writing less code actually. So I guess that's good. So I, it's, is it auto, it's automatically making X into a reference? And mm -hmm. so what, how would X behave as an index with C++ 11? So that's, I, I didn't do that one actually. So I can't tell you, uh, how do you find it? Like, you're probably asking um, this, how you do this same thing. Right? Yeah. With with, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I'll, I'll find out and I'll tell you in the chat. And also um, I was looking up the auto thing and the ampersands. And I saw that like sometimes people were using like ampersand and then the name of the iterator. And then sometimes they were using two ampersands and the name of the iterator. And then there's putting two ampersands and then a space and then the name of the iterator. And it was like really confusing because they were all like different things that were happening as a result. Yeah. And the thing is the ampersand, it also means something else because I'm not sure if this is the same meaning here, but in C++ there's uh, something that they call pointers. So the pointers are when you when you um, store or assign something to a variable, you're not you what you're doing is assigning an address into memory, and so you do that the reference with the ampersand or the asterisk based on what what kind of annotation you're using. Like if it's iterator, mm. you use the asterisk. If it's auto then you have to use the ampersand. But what that does is it tells the code to go to that location, point it, that's where the pointers come from, point it by whatever address is stored here. And so it extracts the value. The thing is, I don't know how you transform or if you can transform this X into an actual index. Because I guess that would be a more useful case. I mean. You just want to look through, but you don't really want to use the elements just once. You want to use the index to access multiple uh, vectors, because then that's in our case. All the examples in the book, they are just the one vector. And so you can just simply do this. But then when you have multiple vectors, imagine here are x, s, and y, x, s, you want to access the same position. So you need the actual index. So, oh. Bye Camilo. Um, Bye Camilo. So I will find I'll find out how you do that because I'm not sure. But yeah, uh, this pointers thing uh, it gets very messy very quickly. Yeah, it was like I was reading about it and getting super confused because I didn't even I had only heard of pointers like in reference to XML or HTML, mm. and I kind of understood yeah. the concept. But thanks for explaining that. Yeah, and. I just, uh, sorry, here I just put that exact same example for using the iterator notation. So it was just for me to say like, these two things are equivalent. So like one of it, it just does more stuff automatically for you, so like finds the type of X and then loops through it, through it. And then the final notation for the same problem is, well, you have to include this, uh, which is like, think of this includes as a library or like a package. Think of this like if you do library uh, plier in R. So you include numeric, and then now you can use this accumulate. And it basically you tell the initial position, the end position, and the initial value. And it does everything with it with all these versions for you. So it, in an optimized way, which is the key thing here. 
the keyword is optimized. So these functions like they have been uh, developed over the years, like tested and debugged. Uh, and so you can do all this stuff just with one line. The only thing to keep in mind here is that based on the initialized value here, if, for example, if I put only zero without the dot zero, then that'll be an integer. And so I'll miss the decimals. So that's right here, they're explicitly using the dot zero dot zero to mean this is double and an integer. Ah, uh, right. So and there's no things, which I just kind of went very quickly over this one, which is the algorithms. Uh, and so again, this STL library, there's a lot of algorithms that have been implemented. Um, and same for like these people working over the years. And the benefits of using this is that they're efficient, all you guarantee that they are correct and they're maintainable, which uh, those are things that when you're developing software, you really want, you want to keep those things. Because then, uh, I mean, I could, probably do the same code in a very inefficient way, which I mean, it, uh, it, the purpose of using C++ is that I want to get better performance. If I'm just gonna implement something that it's not uh, efficient, then I'll just stick with R, base R. Well, uh, I want to go through this one because I think uh, we have seen everything in here other than, for example, this, ST, std dot uh, colon colon upper bound. What about and the S comma notation with the iterator? Like we haven't seen that. Here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So what that is, is you can define in C++ and this applies not just to classes, but to any type. You can say, for example, integer A comma B comma C. And so what that's saying is I want all these three, three objects to be of integer. So here, what it does is it's de it defines two iterators, one called okay. IT and one called position. It's just a sh like a shorthand. Instead of typing this twice, you can just separate them by comma, which is kind of handy. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think other than that. Oh, another thing is, you see this notation? So when you dereference, before we saw it to obtain the value, for well, here we are the using dereference to change the value. So we use the dereference out iterator and then assign the output of this distance uh, function. So another thing to keep in mind. So that out it, out iterator mm -hmm. is I can't figure out like how these are relating to the inputs. Oh, so like yeah. we're creating these three iterators. Yeah, two, two of yeah. which are numeric, one of which and is one int mm -hmm. and then we're starting off Here. it at the X. beginning of X and then, and then out at the beginning of uh, out. Of out, yeah. And then we're going to increment until we get to the end of X. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's saying like upper bound of, I guess Great. we don't know what upper bound is doing really, but yeah. Which is this? It's in my what I what I thought is that well, this is in my vector breaks this is in my vector. So it takes the beginning of that and the end, and then you pass it a an iterator to it. You dereference the value of the iterator. So find the upper bound between these two positions. So between the first position, the last position of breaks at this uh, value of the iterator, because then that'll be like first position, second position, third position, etc. And then uh, this 
Uh, I read in the book that it returns an iterator. So position is an iterator. And then it will calculate distance between the beginning and the, the actual position of the value at that position. I know it says there's too many positions. Uh, well, um, I didn't bother any, like going through much So it's of essentially it. giving like the index of breaks where that particular X value that it is iterating along falls, right? Yeah. Okay. And then that's uh, assigning I mean, that to the dereferenced out, the out IT. So that's like assigning that to the position in out that is exactly. equivalent to the same position in X. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. my God, that was so confusing that reading that the first time. I mean, you see doing? it is like, because there's there's asterisk everywhere, there's plus plus everywhere, and like, you start seeing things and you're like, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's so much all at once. Yeah. Um, then the other thing, which I just didn't really put in slides, because I thought it was like too much, and I was like, I they would say like, just shut up. And, so I just put it very quickly here. Uh, the data structure, which uh, that's one of the things that they will teach you when, when you learn C++ or oh, the data structure, which you don't really talk about them in R. So there's a bunch of them. And for example, uh, once I can talk of like the stack or a queue, which we have talked about the stack, which is uh, when you're doing uh, debugging, the uh, stack call. And so it's the same concept. But then uh, when I learn about stacks, then we'll say uh, you create a class and then you stack objects of that class on top of each other. And then you have like is some sorting. So the last one that you put in, that's the last one that will come out the stack. Then the queue, the last one coming in is the last one coming out or first one coming in, first one coming out. And, and so there's a bunch of them. And the, uh, what I, the key point I want you to get from here is that when you are working in more, with more complex uh, data structures, you don't really have to uh, uh, code them from scratch because most of them have been uh, already in the STL. And then remember STL for you the advantage of functions uh, in classes that have, have been debugged, have been tested, have been optimized. And so if you ever need any more complex data structure, then you should have to look. And in the book, they have some links to like the full list. And then it will be better to look at the list because then you can see what the arguments are, what the data types are, what the output is, and then just to start building up things. So and one of the things that happened was I found out that like the hard way, the RCPP does not know how to convert some of these back to R objects, mm -hmm. like unordered math. Um, it didn't, like it just erred. It's like, don't know. It is like, don't know what to do with unordered math as an output because I found a function that was written in C, like a peak detection function that was written in C that was probably gonna speed up my uh, implementation. And the it outputted an unordered map and unordered map gets defined as like two different values. Cause I guess it's got like a name attribute and then an internal attribute. Mm -hmm. And it had like a character and an integer output. And I tried to return that. It didn't allow it to return. I tried to use the as, uh, and it didn't allow it to be coerced to our objects. And I got stumped. Yeah. I'm just like, well, what do we do with another map? Try to get back into R from that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you could try to look through the map. I think you can look through a map 
and try to put the elements in like two vectors or like however many vectors you can. And then return like a an R object that is just like a list. Well, I don't know if that will work. How do you basically... notate a how would you notate a list with two things in it in C? In C. Mm. I can probably Google that actually. Yeah. I, I haven't done it. So yeah. I might have to look. Uh, okay. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to make use of this chapter and like figure out how to actually implement something complex enough that is useful <laughs> besides yeah. just like sums and loops and I it just failed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is like that when you start, it's like, it's just weird because there, there's so much you have to learn and then things they, they, they don't just go like the first time <laughs> you have to come back and Google stuff and stack or so will save your life probably. Uh, but yeah, uh, I guess as I said before, it, it will pay off at some point. Like just don't give up, keep trying and have a break if, it's, if you're getting stuck. Um, but yeah, it's kind like, of difficult because it's like compiled too. Like you don't know what an error is until it compiles and then it just tells you where it is and you don't know why it erred in that way yeah and i mean for example that error that i had with the simple passing the function like I, the error doesn't tell me anything <laughs> like i, I yeah. have no idea what it is so i probably have to google what the error is and because then that's the problem like there's another layer like that you're obscuring or your warnings and your messages because then yeah. there's an extra layer of, of the stuff going on under the hood. It's difficult. It's yeah. Slow going, slow going. And well, section <laughs> six, good luck. <laughs> you're on your own. I was Hopefully. Like, I started to read those and I was like, yeah, I'm not going through this in the, in the book club because then like one of which will take probably one session and so we'll ignore those for the time being and to me this one is the most uh, uh, interesting one because then I do work in a lot of packages but I'm sure like they're not very efficient and so that's why I want to learn RCPP because then uh, I could try to and then the stuff I do it's a lot of like loops and like or mappings like there's a lot of repetition so I imagine there must be a relatively painless way to use this in a package. And then well, the here are benefits uh, why you should use them. And one of the cool thing is cool things is that uh, when you use RCPP or C++ code in your package, people who use your package don't really need uh, a C++, C++ compiler. And I guess this is only the case if your package is on the ground because then that's compiled on the servers. And then when you do install package, whatever, and then you're just pulling a binary for your OS or something that it's pre-compiled. So that's good. Because some people say, well, that will force people to have to install C++ compiler in their machines if they want to use my code. And, People will say, oh, I don't want to do that. And so that's something to keep in mind. And then there are like a few things that you need in your package, but then use this comes to save the, save the day again. And then there's a use this is our CPP, which will do all the configuration for you, which I mean, if you have ever like, done like packages or want to do packages, use this will save your life. Because a lot of stuff you do use this and you can do like use this Git, use this GitHub, and then it will create the GitHub repository for you. And so it's amazing. And we did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's chapter 25. I'm sorry if it was like, to 
not very clear, but like I try to keep it simple. <laughs> I think you did a great job for talking about two programming languages in one chapter. Yeah. <laughs> It definitely helped to make the chapter more understandable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, that's it. And are we doing something next week? Like a... We can have a virtual commencement. I like that. If um, Do you know if the Zoom link will automatically be generated? Uh, I will say so, because then um, remember that the book clubs, they are they don't really have like a deadline. So mm-hmm. I imagine mm-hmm. you just keep going until we say, tell John, oh, stop that. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're done. I mean, I don't know what we're doing next. Uh, we talk about reading something else, but we can talk about that next week or uh, on the Slack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If we're uh, like moving on to something else in our book. Well, yeah, uh, that's what I had today thank you yeah and thank you so much roberto yeah i hope everyone feels a advanced art programmer now <laughs> go and update your yeah. tv <laughs> i program advanced art programmer <laughs> and then you tell you well explain me what is uh meta programming that that will kill me <laughs> i will be like uh, <laughs> S3, <laughs> which I mean, is something completely different. But yeah, that's something I have to read again. I honestly, meta programming for me, it's like, what is this? <laughs> well, yeah. I'll help you with some meta programming if you help me with some C functions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's the cool thing with this. Like, no, you know, someone that might have an idea. Mm-hmm. might not be an expert but I might have an idea <laughs> of what you're trying to solve and might point to you and say oh I, I know I, I came across the same error you use this link or yeah like honestly yeah. it's good to know that there are people who you can ask questions to because a lot of the R learning R was really frustrating because like I would ask my teacher and they're like I don't oh, know no. <laughs> they knew like deep wire <laughs> and they're like I don't know <laughs> you figure it out <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, when, when I was in my stats courses, like we will use only base R, and I would tell my professor, yeah. "Why not use tidy hands?" <clears throat> oh no, 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 no! I don't want to get into that. I was like, right? <laughs> well, Dplyr didn't it come into existence in like 2015? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's recent, yeah. relatively. I took like a stats class in 2015 and then another in 2016 and both used R, but it was exactly what you were describing where one was using base R and then the other was using deep plier and it was a very different experience. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think before deep plier it was plier, which I don't know if deep plier is a like substitute for plier because I still see people using plier yeah. for certain stuff. Well, like it's plier is and, and utility you know. functions, um, but dplyr is all data frame stuff. But plier is stuff like rounding functions for numeric vectors and <laughs> random stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I've been using a lot like dplyr and like the type of lately. And I think before this book club, uh, I was just a base R person, so <laughs> I've I've been getting into it a lot more. And trying to uh, get my coworkers into the tidyverse, because then they see how like clear, like how easy to read the code is, which is something that I like. Because then you have the pipe, and then uh, to me it's like a a very straightforward way to read your code because it's like one thing at a time, one thing at a time, and not that messy. Uh, mm-hmm function composition that you have something inside something else and then inside 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 which it looks very messy <laughs> not the idea so so okay at this point i should know the answer to this question after going through this whole book but i don't so i'm happy that you're all here <laughs> um tidy r or like the tidy verse is not object-oriented programming is that correct mm. 
it's, it's yeah. functional programming okay yeah well i know things yeah okay I, thank you the closest thing to object-oriented programming without actually using object-oriented <laughs> classes and methods and whatnot is probably data table um because you can do mutative place okay but yeah i think everything yeah. else in r is pretty much all functional yeah. It's for, I guess, like R6 and maybe S4. R6 is yeah. kind of object oriented. Yeah. yeah. You know, R6, oh. sorry. I was just going to say R6 reminds me a lot of C because then you have a class and then you define a class, but then the object has function linked to it, which mm -hmm. is what we saw on R6. So, yeah. yeah. Now, I was actually just going to mention that R6 isn't even really object oriented things because <laughs> you have a class constructor that makes classes, but it itself isn't like a mutable thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also oh. happens with ggproto too, which is like the object oriented system for ggplot2 that's based off R6, um, which doesn't change the state of anything. <laughs> so classes are more like big function factories where you have multiple functions kind of packaged in um, to like a class. So you just call it as if you would call like library or like package call and call in a function. Like you use classes the same way. So you do class dollar sign function, mm -hmm. um, which is very different from like object oriented programming like Python, for example. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, there's much out there. I feel like you never stop learning. Like the more <laughs> you learn, you find things. You know, like I don't know. I don't know anything. <laughs> well, I barely know what I'm doing. Like, uh, I don't know. Which That's I like. The beauty I like of that. learning. <laughs> Keep learning everything. Something. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, y'all. I'm gonna get some dinner. Heck yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sleep now. So. See you all next week. <laughs> yeah, take care. Yeah.